Yeah, so this is more about the scheduler part of this microconference. Uh, this is, uh, so I want to walk you through an investigation I've been doing uh, on my spare time in the past months. Uh, uh, it has to do with uh, how uh, the uh, fair scheduler uh, scales, well, not so well on large systems uh, with respect to uh, idle CPUs. So um, how it all started. So uh, it started by uh, me adding a feature uh, in the Linux scheduler uh, to implement a concurrency ID feature in restart ball sequence. But uh, when I did it, I added a ROS pin lock on the scheduler context which fast paths. That caused regressions that were reported by Intel, AMD, and Oracle. Uh, I did the work to remove those spin locks and modify the algorithm. But then removing a spin lock on the fast path actually caused another performance regression on Actbench. So it was actually faster to take a per task or a global spin lock on the scheduler fast path than to not have the lock. So why is that, right? Uh, so I could reproduce that on a rather large machine with uh, an AMD machine with 192 core over two sockets. And that's a hackbench workload in thread mode, 32 groups, uh, each 20 file descriptors uh, per group uh, using pipes, 100 byte messages. And basically, it's an end-to-end -end rela relationship of producers and consumers, uh, producers filling pipes, consumers waking up the, cons uh, the producers uh, when the pipes uh, are being emptied. So I did several round of, uh, rounds of approaches uh, to kind of get this. So, so the, the end result of those uh, improvements is to bring the Agbench workload from 49 seconds down to 29 seconds. So it's about 40% improvement. So there is room for improvement there. So, what, so, so I, I gradually modified that global spin lock that made no sense to try to figure out what in that spin lock actually sped up the system. So one of the things I've done is to add a delay loop in do idle. That helped. So, so I first noticed that this spin lock, I mean, the place where it was actually useful was when context switching to idle. So I modified that, added the delay loop in idle. Uh, instead, that worked to speed up things. So doing, uh, doing that. I modified that to add a one millisecond delay uh, that I would, where I would tag the run queue to say, well, for uh, run queue selection purposes, consider this run queue as if it was idle. That also sped up things. Then I went with different approaches. So the, the, the idea there is, I mean, that's one workload. The problem is that this can have uh, ill effect for other workloads, right? Uh, as soon as you tweak something. So uh, another approach I did take was to favor almost idle previously see weak, uh, probably previously used CPUs for wake a fine, uh, skipping queued wake ups when the L2A is shared because I noticed that there was a high contention rate on the uh, run queue, uh, on the uh, run queue lock. So uh, using queued wake ups out there, it also changed a bit the, the, the wake up patterns. Uh, I took different approaches, trying also to rate limit task migration. So I added basically uh, so some features that would uh, keep uh, track on a per task basis on uh, when it was recently migrated. So I did that. Biasing the run queue selection towards uh, previous CPU is the latest things uh, I've uh, pushed so far. So, so, and this is where, so Agbench workload speeds up for 40%. Uh, with, uh, uh, with perf uh, stats, I could see that the migration rates uh, kind of lessons when I do those changes. Each of those different approaches are different ways to get that speed up. And then, uh, but uh, for the latest approach uh, uh, I took, uh, which was to bias towards the previous run queue, it did have a, a performance regression for client server workloads, uh, where you have a N one to one relationship between uh, the, the client and the server. So, uh, the latest things I've worked on for the past uh, few weeks. Uh, so, so okay. First, so I come to realize that one of the issue there is that the Linux scheduler is very trigger happy about moving tasks to idle CPUs. So it wants, as long as there's work to be done, it wants this, no CPU to be idle. But the, the problem is that this can cause uh, uh, run queue lock contention. 
and this can have uh, cache and numa miss uh, effects uh, on the on the workload memory patterns so on large system that can become uh, uh, increasingly a problem because then you have uh, much more chances to have some idle cores. The more cores you have on large systems, the more, uh, well, the less locality you will end up having. So, so, and the reason why the Linux scheduler does that is to try to be work conserving so that uh, the, uh, on a system with N CPUs, the N IS priority task would be all running. So that would be the real time definition, but I, I guess it's kind of somewhat applied to the fair scheduler uh, to, to try to fill in the idle uh, CPUs. So what I've been working on for the past two weeks. Uh, so it's a task placement algorithm that I'm cr working on. It's a work, I mean, it, it's a prototype, right? Work in progress. So because, I mean, one way to solve this one-to-one uh, -one workload pattern would be to create yet another heuristic. But I, I find that the fair scheduler already contains a fair amount of heuristics. So I would like to maybe lessen that and try to step back and look at the overall general problem. So what I'm trying to achieve here so is to look at a problem from a communication pattern uh, uh, point of view. So basically, what I've created is a predictor. So uh, I keep on a per, per task basis, I keep a predictor, which is a set of counters that counts the amount of interactions between wakers and wakeys based on the topology of the system. So if I'm a waker and I wake up someone else, I sit on a specific uh, core on a specific uh, L3 cache and on a specific NUMA node. So this is where I am in the topology. The way key also will be woken up somewhere in the topology. So I increment counters based on waker wakey relationship to, to get a, an idea of how much internet connection a given task has uh, uh, with respect to the hierarchy. And my end goal is to converge the task placement so that the tasks get moved together on, uh, as close as possible in the hierarchy when they interact with each other. So it actually seems to uh, work well. Uh, it's not completed yet. I will show what is being done, uh, has been done. So, so yeah. So the goal is to really converge towards a task placement that's based on the communication pattern. Um, so here I, I will discuss a little bit about the run queue metrics. So in the Linux scheduler, so we have the uh, per run queue utilization, runnable, and load average. Utilization is really so for for all the tasks, including the sleeping and blocking tas tasks, this is really the important point. So utilization is the amount of time that is actually uh, used on the CPU for all those tasks that are on the run queue. Runnable is how much they would have liked to run. So if there's over commit, it can go beyond the available time. And the load actually takes into account the weight of tasks. So it's the runnable taking into, into account the weight of tasks as well to compare between run queues. So, why, what I ended up needing uh, uh, here, so it actually worked, did not, so it did not work. Uh, so uh, that started for uh, selecting the previous CPU for uh, putting back a task on it, if there's enough capacity left. So I, it did not work when I used the averages because they take into account the currently sleeping and blocking tasks. So it thinks there's no more room left, but the tasks are actually sleeping. So the enqueued estimate utilization on the uh, metric of the run queue actually works for this because it really remove it only considers it, it excludes the sleeping and blocking task from that metric. But the thing it does not do <clears throat> is considered the overcome it. So it only takes into account the actual task utilization of the CPU. But if they would like to run more, it does not take that into account. So here I've created a a new enqueued runnable metric which takes into account the runnable time, so the time the task wish to be scheduled. Uh, um, yes, one question. how much you are ready to run on the CPU. So that's just highlight the contention on the CPU more than how much you would like to run. That's a, a, um, an important point to make. I mean, okay. because you can still have the right utilization, but you will have to wait twice more than what you would like to run. 
that's really the difference between runnable and utilization. But then runnable kind of gives an idea of the amount of overcome that, that right? Oh yeah, that that's really show the contention that some tasks can have on the same CPU. The renewable is there to say, we have several tasks fighting for the same CPU. Yes. And that will increase the renewable to show this, this fight, in fact. Yes, yes. W which is actually a, a nice characteristic and yeah. something I want to be taken into account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, because I, I tried my algorithm with the predictor with the utilization, and it packed every, so I had like 192, 384 hardware threads, and it was packing all my tasks over 10. So, so because it was thinking, oh, okay, it's not used too much, but no, it's the utilization. So even if they, they, they it was based on the, the slice they had, not the slice they would like to have. It's not what they would like, but they, because they probably don't want more. It's just that they will have to wait to run. And I mean, you might need only one millisecond, but if you are 100 thread waiting on the same CPU, you can wait 100 milliseconds, which is quite huge. Yeah. So, uh, and thanks for correcting me, by the way. I mean, this, this is really, uh, in the past month, I, I have started learning how the fair scheduler works. So, so some of my understanding might be wobbly. So mm. that's good. One more question. How, how do you track the relationship between wakers and wake keys? I can it be of... any task or how, how do you track? Because it can be many tasks and you probably don't know which tasks so are interesting I, which. How the predictor is implemented, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, the predictor here. So it's a set of, so those are counters that are per task. Uh, so I have an array of counters within the task for every core on the system. Uh, and those counters are single byte counters, right? So they accumulate up to 255 and they saturate there. They are all saturated counters and they try to take as little space as possible. So they count the amount of interactions waker wakeys on a per core basis, on a per cluster basis, and on a per new node basis. So it's per core, it's not per... You cannot, you're not tracking any, any random wakey or waker. Yes, I mean, if there's an interaction between a waker and a wakey, uh, they, they will increment the counters according to the topology of the, where the waker and the wake, wakeys were located when the wake up happened. Okay. In both the waker and the wakey. So you know you have a connection point there. Okay. Um, uh, Sorry, like, uh, yes. I just want to interject, like, maybe there's not a lot of time, but I just want to raise the point that, uh, like, coming from Android world, mm -hmm. where we really deal with a lot of general purpose stuff, I find this tradition of continuous to add heuristic, as you said, like, you, you don't want to add another one, is, is, like, just not sustainable anymore. And, like, I'm thinking, like, could we try to solve the problem by potentially try to think how we can rewrite programs differently so that... If Hackbench, for instance, or something similar needs to be packed, which I think the, the kind of characteristic you're looking for, these tasks really would like to stay on the same cache level. That would be a bit better way to try to handle things so that we can start moving towards more system, things that can be portable work across any yeah, so, system. So applications could give hints about task placement. Having, having more hints, basically. Yeah, that could help as well. So That's... instead of like trying to solve it in the camera level. Yeah, actually related to that, I was actually wondering yeah. If we could, if you could achieve some of this by clustering your system. So if you know more or less how many CPUs your application needs, then you do some clusterization, and then the scheduler already kind of uh, knows uh, the boundaries better than the 300 plus uh, CPUs. Available. Yeah. But in this case, the workload is using the whole system. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Depends. Yeah. Just. Yeah. One thing that we discussed in the past, we discussed it is wake up heuristics, and it seems that the, the best way to try to to follow is not using trying to follow wake up heuristics, but moving things to the load balancer, and try to to address these things before the wake up. That was the understanding I think from from four years ago. No, if you... yeah, and, and I'm, I'm coming for the load guy. balancing part. Actually, I still have four minutes left. So, so I guess I'll just, uh, maybe one more question. Yeah, one more question. Um, so if I understand correctly, this speeds things up or reduces latency. 
have you looked at uh, the power side of the ledger? Like when you do this, you're trading off performance versus possibly higher power. Have you taken a look at what this trade-off looks like? Not yet. That's Not a yet. good point. I, I, Thank I you. Think, I think in the last years we had uh, talks, I think Julia speaked about this, that if you pack things on le and fewer CPUs, you can reach more more power savings. There, There is some there's, uh, knowledge. Just, can, can you show your to Julia? You're close. Yeah, okay, so oh, point the, can you stand up so camera can see you? You don't mind. So the point of my talk was that if you pack them on fewer CPUs, then you, those CPUs will have to run at a higher frequency or will get to run at a higher frequency and then you'll be able to finish your application sooner. Um, there's also the whole cost of the uncore and that uncore is going along the whole time. And so if you actually finish sooner, then you can actually save power with respect to your application. Yes. Re re research, just wait, 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 wait for the but yeah. This is only true for a particular system with a particular workload. From what I've seen, the same workload with the same characteristics, move it to a different system with different like DVFS, different like CPU cores, you will get the, the completely different results. So we cannot generalize from like one aspect. You really need to go across the board. It's really hard to, to make sure it's actually mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. true. So I will quickly describe the backtracking. So this is the backtracking. So we start from the core down to the Numa node to try to find somewhere there where there's enough capacity to run. I'll skip over that. Current results, that's my last slide actually, because I know I'm out of time. Uh, so on with this approach, com, um, mainline kernel has 40% idle on all CPUs. With the current algorithm I have, on node zero, they are 10% idle. On node one, they are 66% idle. So I have remaining room cap, uh, cap, uh, capacity left. So I think what I still need to do is integrate with task balancing algorithms to kind of use the predictor uh, shape as a pattern to group tasks together and in one go move the task to node one. So basically because I think what is happening now is that there's so many tasks on node zero that they all get pulled back on node zero all the time. So it, which is why they have a hard time migrating the whole group to node one. But yeah, I mean, that's it. That's what I have. I, th I think you're... One minute. One last question. One short question. <clears throat> yeah. So, do you know exactly what make the performance improvement? I mean, is it really the having the two tasks closer on the same CPU or the same SMT, or is it uh, the fact that you are not waking up some? Uh, I'm not sure about the cause, right? Yeah. What I observe is that the number of migration that uh, drastically uh, reduces. Yeah. And the other thing is, I'm not sure I'm looking at the correct metrics in terms of stalls and cache misses and so on and so forth, because I could not find something very, very much like, oh yes, this is like 15, 20% difference, right? But I, I figured there might be something about the communication. Be being closer yeah. might be better for the group. So, and this is my goal. I want to group the tasks that communicate together as close as possible in the topology of the system. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.